Wednesday for us, this is our last day of feasting, and then on Monday morning, we start uh, beginning our fast, and preparation of Easter, preparation of celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. And we always have on this year, or every year, there's this reading of Christ's first miracle, the changing or transforming of water into wine. And it begins us all every year, because as one great theme of the Lent, and especially as we come before the cross of Christ and we come before His resurrection, we know that transformation is a very integral theme, that we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind, as St. Paul says in Romans, in chapter 12. That we're being changed and transformed, not to conform to this world, but to the word that God has given to us. And so as we hear this first miracle of Christ, this very first miracle is one of transformation, but not of people, but of something very simple in this world, which is water. And he transforms that water to something that is great and well-pleasing, as we hear near the end, where the master of the feast is telling, asking the bride, why did you wait till, uh, to serve the, great, the better wine until now? Now everyone would enjoy it because they're all too drunk to really know the difference. But he knew. But at least he's like, no one else is really going to enjoy it. So why did you wait? But uh, the first thing to remind us is, there was a patience that was needed for the people to be prepared to receive Christ himself. That as we heard in the very beginning, the people on their journey out of Egypt heard the Ten Commandments, and they were waiting for Messiah. Even from the time of Abraham, the time of uh, Adam himself, were waiting for the Messiah. And now the time has come. The best has come now, the time they might not expect it. Or the time that they did not expect it. But it came, and then they taste of it, it is good. And that's something that we need to be mindful of. That he came in the fullness of his time, so that we can receive that blessing. Not in our own time, when we think it should be done, but on his own time. And secondly, as we see, this first miracle wasn't done, as it seems, by Jesus' own accord. St. Mary herself has to ask Christ to do this miracle, right? They see, you know, they're at this party, at this wedding, at the reception, and they're asked, hey, can you, uh, uh, they, they find out they ran out of wine, and, and Mary herself is the one who has that concern. And as a church, especially in the Orthodox tradition, we know that this is one of the first, or key examples from the scriptures that we, have the, that we understand the practice of intercession. That when we seek the, the, the prayers of those who are concerned about us, who are in need, Christ listens. Because these people who intercede are the people who are close to Him, because they always put themselves in His hands. Willingly give themselves to Christ, to God Himself. And we know that in St. Mary, that when she was uh, visited by the Archangel Gabriel, He said, you know, Hail, peace to you, Mary, full of grace, our Lord is with thee. And then He gave her the like, message that you will be the mother of the Lord. And her response is, I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. She uh, submitted her will to God's will. And that throughout the rest of her life, we see throughout the rest of her life during the, in the scriptures, as it's given to us uh, in the Gospels, we see a woman who is always giving to Christ, and at the same time, she's interceding to Christ for us, for the people, for those who are in need. Because she saw simply like, you know, why does she care? You know, you know in some places when you look at some uh, commentary, they might say that there was a relative of Jesus or a cousin or you know, at least a neighbor. That's where they were all invited, these, all these people in Galilee. Because that's where Jesus grew up. But at the same time, she, she could just, you know, whatever, they ran out of wine, let them deal with it. But she has a concern for something very simple of the feast to continue to be going. And so she interceded. And so we know that the prayers of those who are close to Christ are always beneficial for us. So that we seek prayers from others because we know that those who are we trust and those who we seek uh, guidance from or we trust in their faithfulness, they might not have to be perfect. Even say, we don't say it was perfect. But she was always willing to give everything to her. And that's what she was chosen. That her life of willingness to be perfect because of what God has given to her, she shows us the life of uh, living in Christ. In the same way, all of us can intercede to another. But at the same time, as an Orthodox Church, we know that our that life of intercession doesn't end with death, but we know that it continues in the life everlasting. 
So we seek St. Mary's prayers because we know that from this very simple uh, account of her uh, relationship with Jesus, we see that he does listen. That he does listen to her for our needs. Maybe not the way that we expect, because even Jesus' response to her was, why does it bother to me? You know, why do you worry bother with it? But he still follows through on what is necessary and what's needed. And so as we remind ourselves that as we begin this great Lent, don't think that we are not in need of prayers of others. Because just like, you know, uh, the interesting thing when, when I went to seminary, they said the most difficult time in seminary is always Great Lent. That's when most people, the most bitter, the most hateful, or most, un, you know, like the unkind. Like, everyone's so nice when you start out seminary. And so my first year, I come in the fall in August, and everyone's so nice, and you get to know each other. And it's like, oh, don't, you know, just wait. You know, it's nice, because everything's new and you're learning. And so wait until you get to Great Lent. And all the strict prayers, and we're getting up at 4 in the morning to go to the monastery church and to do all these long prayers. And they're like, at first it's kind of nice, oh, it's pretty cool. Just get up in the morning, everyone's kind of standing there, some of us are falling asleep, it's kind of funny. But when you go through those 50 days, it starts to wear on you, trying your best. And as uh, you know, Stidermanians and Nazis have always told me, like, when we try to come closer to, G- uh, to Christ, the devil always tries even harder to take us away. And that's why I say we need the intercession of those who are close to us, you know, that we know that are close to Christ, so that they can help us by their, uh, help us by their prayers. And that's the first thing that we need mindful of as we begin the Great Lent. And the second thing, and one thing that I want to be as an overarching theme uh, during this Lenten season, what I want us to kind of be thinking about is, what was transformed in today's uh, passage? And what are we needing to be changed and transformed in our, in our lives? Because we know that Jesus transformed water into wine, right? But how did he do it? He had water that was given, and he had six pots, right? Uh, earthen pots or stone pots, it says, that were used for purification, that were empty. And I want us to kind of think that as an, an imagery for our own spiritual life. Water that has nothing in it, except, but it's a basic part of life, but it's formless. It takes whatever shape that you pour it into. And there's many people like us and our spiritual that are like that. We're a very blank slate. We're, we're wanting to do everything for God, but we have no form. We don't know what we should be doing. And we're waiting for something to change in us. We're waiting something for to happen. And in this passage, that water that was called at that day in Cana was transformed into wine. That its will, God's will for that part of water was manifested on that day. And it was a joy, and the people rejoiced in tasting that water that had become wine. And that's many of us. We're waiting for us to be able to rejoice and to be able to rejoice in us. But many times we feel plain like water. We have no form. And we're looking for someone to shape us. But it took Christ to tell us where we needed to be. That water needed to be in that earthen pot to be transformed. That's something I want us to be thinking about meditating as we uh, begin this great land. Are we like that kind of a spiritual person where we're just waiting for God to say something to us to transform us? Are we impatient or are we still lurking and uh, searching and yearning? Or do we have no yearning? Like some other words that we just say anywhere else. But not present at that right time to hear God's word to say, this water will be wine. And the second type of person that I want to think about, a separate second type of spiritual person that we can be, is like those earthen pots, which are empty, have nothing in it. We feel like we have a shape. We feel like, I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing. God has told me to be at this church. Or God has told me to be at this location, you know, at this workplace. Or that God has told me to be at this school. Or God has told me to be in this person's life. But we're empty on the inside. So we are, we're, we're like, we think we're doing the right things, but we're actually, you know, we're like at a loss because we're empty. And we're waiting for God to fill us with the right thing or the right aspect or whatever it might be the right. And truly, in the end, in the end it's the right grace to be poured into us. But we're empty. We're not, you know, we're waiting for that place. And so those of us, as we find ourselves, and I want us to be thinking about doing this week, where we're at, are we that formless b- b- body that's not knowing what shape we are and we're just kind of lost, or are we kind of that, feel like we know where we're at, but we feel we're empty? We have to see where are we putting Christ in that process of our lives? Where are we seeing ourselves? Because during this Lenten journey, we should be hopefully seeing, first and foremost, we should be journeying always to the cross of Christ. But the second time, we have to internally think to ourselves, because just like in anything, that we, all of us want to rejoice and be in the kingdom. All of us want to be happy and joyful. And our families should be joyful. Just like this, this couple at this wedding and their families want to be a joyful occasion. But if we don't have those around us who can intercede for us, we'll be suffering. Because like if they didn't have St. Mary there, what would happen? They'd, just, they'd be, the, they would be the family that did, ran out of wine. They'd be like, oh, that was a terrible wedding. Yes. <laughs> Everything else could have been fine, but they'd be like, oh, you're the one that had ran out of wine. And that would be very hurtful, right? Or we're going to be like those people that... We can find ourselves where, like, we went to a great place, but then I feel empty when I left. Like, I went to that church, or I went to that meeting, I went to that service project, I went to that 
but I'm sorry, I went to that event where someone had told me to go to, but I felt empty on the inside because we weren't at the right place or we weren't ready to receive that word where God was filling us. We didn't see God pouring that water into us, as he said. And so we have to be mindful of that and where we, what we should be doing. And hopefully, as we go to this great land, as we pray and as we fast, we start seeing where God is filling that water into our hearts so that it becomes that good wine that rejoices and overflows with joy. And that if you go to this land, let that, let, we have to be protective of that joy so that it doesn't cause us to be bitter because we're, oh, it's so hard to be like Christ when I'm doing this land. But truly, I'm rejoicing because even in that struggle and that difficulty of trying to be like Christ, I am that, I am that wine that the people tasted in Canada, that they were rejoiced when they came to my, you know, when they saw me, or they came and tasted who I am. And that's all of us. Even God himself rejoices when he sees us, those of us who struggle and are willing to put ourselves in that right place in the right time to be filled by his grace. So let that fill our hearts, minds, and souls, now and always, and forever and ever.